Hello, I'm Kwame Ennis, and welcome to the People's Forum. Welcome back, welcome back. Uh, I'm chomping at the bit here, I'm excited. We have an extremely important topic. The topic is immigration, legal or illegal, um, what our uh, stance is. We have a phenomenal, phenomenal panel here. We have Mr. Robert Hornack, the former director of the Republican Party in Queens, New York. Thank you. Um, sitting next to him is Mr. Rafael Pazmino. Excuse me, Rafael, pardon me for that. Um, he's a, an attorney here in New York City. And uh, next to him is Ms. Patricia Smith, uh, former ACS supervisor and social worker. Thank you. Here we go. We're going to get right into it. Um, I need to know, first of all, what your thoughts are on immigration, legal versus illegal. This is pretty much uh, a legal question. Uh, Rafi, can you take that, please? Yeah, I mean, I don't... Legal or illegal, the, the, the big question that's surrounding us now in this country is what do we do with all these kids that are coming into the country illegally? And how do we try to legalize them? And there are a lot of mechanisms to do that. Um, one is um, obviously what they're doing now is asylum or the special immigrant juvenile application where a guardian uh, can seek a petition, uh, a person can seek a, a petition for guardianship and the child will get the green card automatically. Those are the two avenues on that situation. The other is uh, all the uh, folks that are here illegally, how do they legalize? There are a couple of ways to do that, but I guess we'll talk about that well, here. That's what I want to do that. I, I jumped the gun a little. I'm always very anxious right. when it comes to exciting topics. But what currently is the policy here in the United States for immigration? I'm talking about to our southern border, to our northern border, and overseas. Okay, uh, very simple. Overseas folks that come in with a tourist visa, even mm -hmm. Canada, they marry a U.S. citizen, they could stay. Within six months, they'll do a... 45 application called adjustment of status to adjust their status from uh, tourist to green card holder. Mm -hmm. That process takes six to eight months and they have to marry a U.S. citizen. Um, usually folks from Europe, uh, China, J you know, e Asia, they come in with a tourist visa and they can easily adjust marrying a U.S. citizen. Now someone crossing illegally that's here marry a U.S. citizen, they, they, can't, they don't qualify for that type of adjustment here in the United States. They have to go back to their country. The old rule was that they would have to wait... Ten years. Right. But under President Obama, he created something called the Provisional Waiver, a 601A, mm -hmm. where basically if it's approved here, you go back to your native country and you're, you're back in 30 days. So that's still in place now. It's called an I-601A waiver. Question, is that a reality or is that a fantasy? Well, it's a reality. I've gotten some approved. Um, the problem that we're having now is that there are people that are in immigration proceedings um, as we speak, and under President Obama and Eric Holder, um, he instructed the prosecutors to basically do a termination of proceedings. When the proceedings would be terminated, they would go back and come back. Now that option is not available, and that's the problem we're having with folks that are in proceedings. So even if the waiver is approved, they're not terminating proceedings in immigration court. They're going to have to do voluntary departure, and they might be forced to stay one to ten years overseas mm -hmm. and that's something that we're encountering for the last few months so I don't how that's playing out now I don't you know what we're gonna do there in one of our last shows um, we had to go on record to say that the immigration process in the United States is broken um, do you agree with that I, I think it's we could men we, we there, there are mechanisms that we could use to try to fix it and there are a lot of uh, ways to do that there's one procedure in immigration court that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, it's basically if you're here for 10 years or greater and you have a qualifying relative, a wife, a parent, or, a, or a, your child being a, a resident or a citizen, you could qualify for a green card. Yes. Yeah, the, the problem Our, is hardship. You have to prove an exceptional hardship on the American going back to your native country. Okay, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you said that because that brings us to our president, uh, Mr. Donald Trump. Um, I've got something to put on the screen and I would like you guys to get a look at it because this was a statement that the president made approximately a week ago, uh, maybe less than that. He was in, uh, he was in the uh, United Kingdom um, with, the, with the, uh, Theresa May, and he made this statement. I just think it's changing the culture. I think it is a very negative thing for Europe. I think it's very negative. 
not to uh, misquote him, I have a second one. Allowing the immigration to take place in Europe is a shame. Trump said, I think it changed the fabric of Europe, and unless you act very quickly, it will never going to be the same the way it was. I don't mean that in, in a positive way, so I think allowing millions and millions of people to come to Europe is very, very sad. I think you're losing your culture. Is that a fair statement to be made by the President of the United States, a country that we have a Statue of Liberty, uh, you know, r right here in our ocean? Bring us, you, you know, your, your hungry, your, your poor, your meek. Well, what, may I jump in? Please. Uh, what, what President Trump is specifically speaking to there is the huge wave of uh, Muslim immigrants that are going into Central Europe and causing a tremendous amount of conflict. If you look at all of the countries that have taken in large numbers of Muslim immigrants, whether it's England, uh, France, Germany, they're all having revolts because the people are not, well, we, in America, we believe in, you come to America, you're an immigrant, we welcome you, but we want you to assimilate and become an American. In Europe, they're not doing that, and they're not even encouraging that. I have a question, Robert. What does that mean? What is an American? <clears throat> Please. Well, it, it's, it's a very amorphous concept. It's, it's we are, our, our, our identity is constantly changing because of immigration, and that's actually, I think, a very good thing. So then we, how we, we, we uh, absorb the best that the world has to offer and incorporate that into our culture. I think that's an idealistic thing, the best. Sometimes people aren't mm -hmm. doing their best. Many mm -hmm. of these people from these regions are, are fleeing poverty, they're fleeing mm -hmm. war, they're fleeing starvation. They're fleeing things for a reason. Oh, and well, the, absolutely. the countries where they have stability, mm -hmm. They are coming here. They're very, very comfortable. They might come here, as you said, on an, edu on an education visa. Mm -hmm. They get a four-year, six-year uh, PhD degree, and then they're going home to make changes. Um, the people that are coming here to feed their families and assist their families, you know, this is life and death. This is not a, a, a game. It's no, either it's stay not. at home and die or come here and live. Mm -hmm. That's true. But here's the thing. We have to be uh, able to control our borders. And ultimately... As a nation, we need to decide who we're going to allow in. If we just say everybody that's uh, under, under uh, dire circumstances where they live is welcome to come here, the entire world would come here. We certainly could not accommodate the hundreds of millions of people immigrating into this country. Um, and that's, I, what, that's what the concept of open borders would eventually lead to. I understand what you're saying. No one's asking for an open border, mm -hmm. but I think the statistics malign exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, our number one source country, according to the statistics of 2017, is Southeast, Southeast Asia and East Asia. Yes. That's number one. Um, we don't have any security issues. People fly in, you know, via jetliners, JFK, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and all the such. So can you speak to that? Well, I'm not saying that they, that shouldn't be the case. We welcome that immigration. A lot of those people are coming over on the uh, H-1B visas. They're coming over to work in, in, uh, in uh, internet companies and technology and medicine. Um, but there are people that are coming over at, uh, who have lower level skills. Mm -hmm. And they are certainly welcome here. We welcome and have always welcomed people of all skill levels and of all backgrounds. But we have always historically encouraged them to assimilate, to learn the language, to learn the culture, and to find a way to carve a niche out even if they, if they formed, you know, every, everybody when they've come over, whether they were Italians, Jews, uh, whomever, uh, they, they formed little ghettos when they first got here, but they found a way to assimilate their culture into ours. And their culture was not the same as the Americans who were here before them, but it also wasn't the same as where they came from either. It was something in between. It became a hybrid. America's a quilt. We're, patch, we're a exactly. patchwork of, of different nations, different ethnicities, different right. religions, and they're supposed to be able to come mm -hmm. here and be comfortable and not be persecuted. Absolutely. I agree with you on that. I mean, don't mistake what I said earlier about us taking in the best the world has to offer to, to mean that we only take in people of, of accomplishment. That's not what I meant. The, what I meant by the best the world has to offer is all different cultures, a wide variety of experiences and uh, people that can bring their, uh, the way that they've lived into our culture and make it part of our culture. It doesn't have to be highbrow to be welcome. It can be some of the greatest, some of our greatest history in this country originated from the, the, the masses, originated from people that were struggling 
uh, whether it was uh, food or customs or whatever. Uh, the, best, the, the best that we appreciate here in this country, I think, has risen up from that which people created out of struggle. I'm not going to uh, let previous presidents off the hook. Um, we've been pretty cruel and pretty mean um, in our uh, administration of these mm -hmm. policies. Some of these policies are based on religion. Um, if you're from a Muslim country, they were, they were talking about banning uh, people from Muslim countries. All Muslim people in Muslim countries don't agree with their government because mm -hmm. all Muslim or Christian people here in America don't agree with the government. Um, but we put them in a corner and say that what uh, you, your president may have been doing is what you want him to do. All Saddam's people were supposed to be um, being freed from tyranny, you know. But I have statistics here that says less than 50 percent of them even get visas um, at the consulate in their countries. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a problem. That's unfair. Yeah, it is. How do you get out of war-torn region if you can't even get a visa to get on the plane? You know, Claudia, we, we, there's a very complex dynamic problem going on in the world. And I'm not saying I have the answer to this, but here's what happens. You look at countries like Syria. You've got um, very moderate Muslims that live there. You've got very radical Muslims, and they're clashing. That's what the fight is often between in the Middle East, between the moderates and the, and the extremists. It would be great if we said to all of the moderates, you're welcome to come here to America and we will provide you with a new home. And I don't really have a problem with doing that. But the problem then what you find is that you leave behind a country that is so radicalized that it becomes a threat to its neighbors and a threat to its region. So the ultimate answer, I don't, I don't know, is do you bring those people here to allow them to flourish in a safe environment? Or do we encourage the conflict, if you will, to try to create a balance between the radical and the moderate? I don't have the answer to that question. It's a very complex one. Do you think you might have an answer for that, uh, Ralph? Well, look, all that stuff is a U.S. consulate. They decide who comes, how many visas are issued. You can't even uh, go to court to debate that. That's yeah, the problem. The, the quotas for right. um, African countries, both sub-Saharan and, and, and northern African countries, the quotas for Central American countries, the quotas for um, the, many of the islands are... 10% of what the quotas are to some other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's strictly based on ethnicity, religion, and race, and economic ability. Um, we have a place, you know, uh, a wonderful place that I've actually visited uh, called Cuba. You know, 75% of the visa applications are denied at the consulate, mm -hmm. you know, and all the people don't agree with the government, you know, yeah. and that's simply not fair. Well, it's also not fair, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have an open immigration system or an uh, accepting immigration system. We should. And maybe ultimately we need to look at the quotas that we have and raise them. Maybe one of the things we could do to alleviate the pressure on illegal immigration is to increase legal immigration. That might be a solution that could work. But what's not fair to anybody is to allow this hybrid system where people that want to come here legally go through the process, they could spend... Robert, I'm going to have to halt you. Um, we're going to cut it to you when we come right back. Okay. When we come back, we're going to finish with Robert's statement and we're going to deal with DACA. We're going to have uh, Ms. Patricia Smith, who's a social worker, talk about what, what the route is for those children and we're going to uh, get, back, get more into it. Yeah, can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why did the girl ask the mushroom to dance? Because he was a fun guy. <laughs> what do you call a pig that knows karate? Pork chop. Uh, 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 uh. Um, so how does a tissue dance? Put a little buggy on it. <laughs> okay, welcome back. Before we left for a break, uh, Mr. Harnack was continuing. Please, Rob, go ahead. What I was saying was uh, it's what's not fair to anybody is to have this hybrid system where we have illegal immigration system where people will who want to do it the right way go through the process. It could take them years and years and tremendous expense to come to this country illegally. And then we have this second almost like a sort of like a, 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 a lottery system where you come here illegally and well we're just going to turn a blind eye to that and we're going to let you go off and do whatever it is you want to do. And granted, you're forfeiting certain advantages of being a legal immigrant, but you're here in this country. And the people that come here through the legal process resent that.
because they have gone through that process and they don't want to see the system being short-circuited, the line essentially being cut by people uh, who think that they have a right to come here whenever they want. We also don't have the ability to screen those people and say, are you a, a, a criminal where you came from? Uh, were you a child abuser? Uh, were you, are, are you tied to a terrorist organization? Those are the people we ultimately want to keep out. And we don't have the ability to do that if we're just going to allow tremendous amounts of illegal immigration to come. But the vast majority of those people aren't tied to no. terrorist organizations. No, I'm not insinuating that they, they are. They aren't criminals. The vast mm -hmm. majority of those people are families looking for a better way of life. Absolutely. They're looking for food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. They're looking for education and upward mobility mm -hmm. for their children. They're here searching for the American dream. Yes, and I want we them to We sell that dream nation uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. We sell that dream. But when we people do. come here to take us up on the offer, mm -hmm. then we, then we want to renege. Well, I don't think we should be reneging. Like I said, I think we should be looking at increasing our quotas. I don't think our, our levels are I want to speak, high enough. I want to speak to one of the elephants in the room, and mm -hmm. that is Mexico, Central, South America, um, what's going on right now with many of these you know, young people, children, you know, mothers and fathers carrying infants and babies, teenagers being sent off with a backpack and, you know, a couple of hundred dollars and a phone number and told, you know, find your aunt in California. I want to speak to that because those people are being stopped in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Texas, and they're being put through a horrible, horrible, horrible gauntlet. Mm -hmm. um, many times only to be sent back and face the same persecution and or death that they were running from. Um, can you please speak about that? Many of these families are, are really seeking asylum uh, from the countries that they come from of origin. Uh, they have already gone through such horrible situations in their countries and sometimes they narrowly escape their country to come to the United States where they see the United States as a place of refuge. And the, 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 the ones that, that are really suffering right now are the children. The children are, are being separated from the parent or from the mother. Um, this new policy that we have that was done by Donald Trump, recently, they, they, I think they failed to meet the deadline to return the children. I don't know how many exactly children would not return at this point but they, they did not reach the deadline to return all the children back to the parents. And one of the things that we are having is that these children, the short-term effect on these children is great. They are unfortunately not able to cope with being separated from their parent. They are in a situation where they are identifying with whoever they can identify with, adults who are not their parent, just to, just to survive. <clears throat> I want to allow Ralph to speak to the, the legal, our legal responsibility yes. to the children and how long they're, they're allowed to keep the families. Well, they come in as un, if they come in as unaccompanied minors, they have to try to locate their family. So what's happening now is they contact a family member, they go to the facility and pick the child up. Generally, I know the rules, the problem is a lot of them are coming with their parents, as, as she's indicated, or an aunt and uncle and they're being separated. The go American government sometimes takes the position, um, even that being, the, or call the uncle, as you said earlier, who's the uncle? Where are we sending this child to? Because we have a responsibility. Um, but they do release them and then the child, when they come out, they'll they seek asylum or guardianship through their uncle. Now, it doesn't matter what the legal status of that uncle or aunt is. As long as they're really, they, they don't need a legal status. They go to a state court here in New York, they go to a state court, a uh, juvenile court, and the judge will give them guardianship. With that, with that letter and that certification, you apply, some, um, you apply for special immigrant juvenile in the immigration court under a form I-360 that the only requirement is that state order providing, and it goes through a social worker and, and items, stuff like that. So once that occurs, the child gets a green card. It's a three, to, it's a two to four year process, roughly. And it's until the, the child, the child will age out in New York at 21. So you have 20 year olds that come across the border 
and you could do that. As long as you come in and the state orders before 21, you could get it. Even though, as you indicated, the immigration system is broken because of longevity of the application. It might take longer. They could be 24, but as long as they do it before 21, it's fine. Robert, what's your position on this? Well, yeah, my heart breaks for these kids. It really does. But we also have to realize that the adults that are bringing these kids across the border are doing so in a manner that risks their lives. A lot of these kids actually die in transit because they're coming through a desert, they're lacking food and water, and they don't actually make it across. The ones that do make it across, they're being apprehended by Border Patrol. Now, well, the change that the Trump administration made, and I think rightly so, was that if, we're, if we catch you coming across the border illegally, we're not going to do catch and release anymore. We're not just going to give you a t essentially a ticket and a court date and say come back in six months because they never come back. So what they're doing is they're actually prosecuting, particularly if they're repeat offenders, if they've tried to cross the border illegally previously, they're going to be prosecuted. They're held in detention. Now, according to a court decision that was rendered back in the Clinton administration, the children, and you can confirm this, cannot be held uh, for more than 20 days because the children aren't being charged with anything. So to keep the children in criminal detention with the parents, I think, would be immoral. That's why the children are being separated. They can't be held for more than 20 days, and they really can't be held in criminal detention with the parents. So they're being taken charge of by Health and Human Services and being treated like any child that ACS took away from abusive parents would, would be treated. They're being, they're being put up in, in temporary homes with guardians, and they're being given very good treatment, food and shelter and whatever they need. So they're not being abused. It might be traumatic for them to be separated from their parents, and certainly I can, I can grieve for them for that. That's not their fault. But it is their parents' fault, and their parents risk their children's lives. Maybe you would say, and I would not disagree with you, that they were coming from a life or death situation to begin with. But they should have, if they were legitimate uh, candidates for asylum, they should have applied legally for asylum, and then they would have gone through the asylum process, which is very different from the process they're going through now, which is coming across the border illegally and being detained and prosecuted. Let me say, these families are drowning. Mm -hmm. So if you've, got a, if you've got a drowning family in the water and they're treading water and mm -hmm. they've been out there hours and they're cramping up. You want to throw them a lifeline. You need to throw them mm -hmm. a lifeline. Yes. You can't ask them, oh, could you just hold on another two or three years? Yeah. And, and I'm not, call me, I'm not asking them to. I'm just saying there's a process. If you're a legitimate candidate. But the process candidate, isn't working. That's the problem. The process no. obviously isn't working. We're in a disaster area right now. We're in crisis. The country is in crisis. So obviously, obviously we have to look at the situation that the process that exists at this moment isn't working for those people who are drowning. And we have too many people coming in from those countries or same countries that are really coming here for asylum for, to, to, and they're fleeing a severe, dangerous situations. Like I said, if they are legitimate candidates for asylum, they are being put through an asylum process and they get a hearing and they get care. They are not being locked up and they're not being separated from their, from their children. If they're legitimate candidates or they legitimately apply for asylum, it's only when they come across the border illegally and then ask for asylum once they get caught that they go through this alternate process. Now, maybe that doesn't work for them, but at the end of the day, we have to be a country of rules and laws. We have to have a process. Otherwise, it's anarchy and everybody just comes as they want. Before I move to the next topic, I want to say one thing. Um, if these countries, Central and South America, are continuously destabilized mm -hmm. and continuously in economic turmoil, um, we, don't, we haven't spoken about the drug uh, issue mm -hmm. um, in terms of marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and the, and the gangs and, and, and how they really rule a lot of these smaller areas. Um, what do you expect people to do? When Mexico is doing well, as it states here in 2015, from 2001 to 2015, the, the, the number of, of, of immig immigrants that came into this country from Mexico dropped almost in half, from 52% to 28%. Mm -hmm. That's because the country started to do better. Yes. When the country does better and offers opportunity, people stay home. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to leave home. People who come here, even in my background from the West Indies, you come here, you work, you make enough money, and as soon as you're able to retire, 
You sell your house here, leave it to the kids, and you're going back home where you can sit with your friends and play dominoes. Mm -hmm. That's the American dream. That's what every woman wants to do. Yes. Um, I've only got four minutes left, and I don't want to leave the DACA kids out. I think it's an extremely important topic. Can you please speak to DACA, Ralph? Yeah, um, I know it wasn't renewed, my understanding. Um, it, it's a problem with these kids. Um, pres under President Obama, it was approved. Now, now it's not, so they're going to be in limbo. What some of these kids did do, and, and I didn't have too many of those applications, because fortunately, you know, they, they came here when they were two or three years old. They speak perfect English, and they could read and write, and they use their guidance counselors for those types of applications. I did, think I only did two or three of those. Mm -hmm. And they were approved. The issue that uh, what a lot of them did was they would go overseas, do an educational type of uh, excursion, so they would uh, be paroled in. And through that, they could marry a U.S. citizen, because a lot of these kids came through the border. So, but that's a very small number. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do now with, with, with them. They had an employment authorization card with a SOC. Eventually, they can't renew that. And their concern is, will they be processed? I, I, I hope not. Pat, can you speak to your experiences? Um, my experience is with these families, these children that are being forcibly separated. Are we talking about DACA? Yes. Those young people with DACA are very sophisticated. They are American citizens, even though they didn't come in um, the correct way. They do. A, they some of them were um, in Robert's word. They've assimilated. They assimilated. They've been to school here. Yes. They yes. play little league. Yes. Uh, they've been in the Boy Scouts, and then all of a sudden they're going to be possible. uprooted and, and sent so, to a country that they're not even familiar with. Yes, and that's the problem because for them to go back to a country they're not familiar with, they don't even speak the language. Some of these young people, and that's the problem. Um, they see themselves as Americans a hundred percent. And they want to be Americans. So DACA, again, is, is a failed system that needs to be looked at and, 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 and um, reformed. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, these kids should absolutely not be sent back. Uh, speaking of this purely from a political perspective, a deal will be worked out. It's, it's inevitable that something's going to happen. Nobody's going to let these kids be deported ultimately. Because at the end of the day, they, have a, they, they, they didn't assimilate. They were, essentially grew up here. This is the only culture they know. They are Americans through and through. Robert, and, uh, uh, once again, you are the victim of our station break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Good timing. Um, I'd like to wrap this up. The main thing that we have to recognize, I think, and search our conscience um, is countries like America, Great Britain, the, 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 the colonial powers, the imperialist powers, um, I'm sorry, they're, you're on the hook. You created these situations hundreds of years ago. You've benefited from these situations. And now that there are conflict zones all over the world, you can't say, oh, well, you know, we need to revisit this. No, you have a responsibility to people. Ultimately, there's a humanitarian responsibility, and we need to live up to our words. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you guys for coming. It's, it's been an exciting debate, and I'd like to have you back again soon. I'm Kwame Ennis from the People's Forum. Once again, you can... Email us at peoplestalkforum at gmail.com. You can phone call us, uh, area code 646-238-9808. Um, we, we appreciate your comments. We appreciate um, if you'd like to come on the show or you know any, a topic that you'd like us to have, send us your comments. Thank you very much.